the merits a little bit, you can feel free, Mr. Say now. Uh, but uh, the floor is yours. Your Honor, may I remain seated and speak into the mic? Please? That's fine. Thank you. I think the first thing the court has to address is whether or not a First Amendment constitutional as applied challenge is ripe for pretrial consideration. Uh, being candid with the court, if the court says it's not ripe, then making the rest of the argument is probably uh, not the right time. On the other hand, we have already argued under Hall, and there's been other cases cited, that as long as we uh, agree to, for purposes of the motion, uh, the facts, not other allegations, but the facts, it is right. So I, I almost pause it back to the court whether sure. or not we're in that posture. And we, and we can do a little quick ping pong here if we need to, just so we know kind of what, what the guardrails are. So I, I, I take a, a closer look at Hall, and I think there's a follow-up case, I think it was Boyer, maybe Bayer, I forget what it was called. Um, and certainly they're, they're going right at it as an as-applied challenge. There's a little language there I, was, I wanted you all to kind of give me your take on, where I think the quote was, it's well established that vagueness challenges to statutes which do not involve the First Amendment freedoms must be examined in the light of the facts at hand. And so if you take the inverse of that, it almost makes it sound like you should not be considering First Amendment uh, challenges as applied. Um, so I'm curious your take on that. Uh, but setting that aside, I mean, it certainly seems in other jurisdictions as applied First Amendment challenges happen all the time. And so it could just be that we haven't actually had the opportunity here in Georgia to address that on the merits. I don't know. Um, but what also seemed clear, even reading halls, that if we're in making an as-applied challenge, we're within the confines of the indictment because uh, unlike Hall, the state hasn't said, here are some additional facts that we're willing to stipulate to or concede to or anything like that. What do you t what, any, any and all of that, any reactions? Uh, I understand how the court could look at the inverse, but I think as written with all the justices agreeing that it is a First Amendment challenge would be right, a constitutional challenge on the First Amendment grounds, uh, as long as we accept all the well-pleaded factual allegations in the indictment and don't go beyond those. Now, as the court has indicated, the state at this point uh, has not set forth or stipulated to any other facts, although I think some of them, for example, uh, the fact of how a letter gets to the Secretary of State or uh, a telephone call that uh, is an issue, I think those things are clear throughout the record in this case. But I'm not sure that they're necessary for the court to make an as-applied challenge. And as such, uh, I think we can be limited to the well-pleaded facts, both in the RICO count, count one, as well as the other counts in the indictment. Well, well let's just start there. Uh, Mr. Wakeford, any reactions kind of to some of those things I brought up in, in Mr. Sadow's response? Will it annoy the court if I actually come You can stand wherever you'd like. Okay. Um, I, I think we we got to start with Hall. Your Honor, and I'm glad you, you pointed to that language because that was going to be the first thing I wanted to address today. Hall, Hall descends from a case called National Dairy, which it, it, the language in Hall says, in cases like this, we're confined, we look at the, the charge conduct. That's what we look to. And, and, and Hall, of course, was, they looked outside of the charging instrument to these other facts. Yeah, so it seems like that's not going to be an issue here because the state's not saying, here's our entire theory of the case. So what, what stops us from doing an as-applied First Amendment challenge just based on the indictment itself? That's a limited one. And you, and you kind of have a leg up since you get to put whatever you want in the indictment generally. Well, that, um, and that's kind of the thing, is that when you look at the post-hearing brief uh, from the defendant, uh, and you actually look at footnote two, he, he's not actually asking the court to look at, at the well-pleading uh, allegations in the indictment. He's actually asking the court to read out certain, certain words, all of which have to do with intent. Um, so footnote two on page two, he says, if, if, if it says something's unlawfully or knowingly or willfully done, uh, that's not a factual allegation the court should consider. So the, the suggestion seems to be, oh, let's, let's look to Hall. Hall says we can play kind of fast and loose with what the facts are. And in this case, what we want the court to do is read out certain language from the indictment, actually not consider it. Okay. Just look well, at let's say we don't get to that further step and, and we are just, just getting over that threshold, even if there was no footnote too. Any position at this point on can we make an as-applied First Amendment analysis of this? So it's, it's true in federal courts. It's kind of all over the place. Some courts explicitly stay away from it, and other courts go into it. We know that in this, 
In this defendant's case in D.C., actually, Judge Chutkin explicitly went forward and made an analysis based on the allegations in the indictment there. Uh, but not every court does, and some federal courts stay away from it for a very specific reason, which is that there are still factual allegations which have to be settled by a fact finder for a jury. And the, the, the and, reason... And looking at all the cases as, have you, that you found, ones that didn't do it, I know generally they're going to say we don't have the record, we don't have the facts, but there, were there any that explicitly said, even though I could just look solely at the indictment, I'm still not going to do an as-applied challenge? Well, I think that's how we get to a case here in Georgia, and it's a case your honor cited back in October when you explicitly ruled. I, I'm, I'm, we're not yeah. going to get into this. That was the, the 11th Circuit case, though, wasn't it? You're talking about. I'm talking about the major case, okay. which is the Georgia case. The major case is where they say, okay, this is a pretrial, as applied, First Amendment challenge. But essentially what this boils down to is an argument about intent. That's what the defendant's really talking about. And when you look at what the defendant wants to argue about here today, it's just saying, mm -hmm. well, I was talking, I was just a guy saying things. I was just advocating. I was just speaking my mind. And so all of this is protected, and therefore the entire thing has to go away. That, and, and, that is and a I question. I think that's your, your, your strong argument, strongest argument on if we're, we're in the analysis of the as-applied challenge. I'm still just trying to get over and, and, and really understand the procedural element of it. Well, and, and that's what Major says, is that because that intent question has yet to be answered and the jury is the person, who is the, the entity that answers that question, it's premature to consider this. It's, and you can't say that the First Amendment has been applied or that the as-applied challenge can succeed at this stage because there's still questions that have to be answered. But Major, I think it was like an overbreath. Uh, on terroristic threats, right? It begins with overbreath, but then it moves into an as applied challenge. That's the last part of the major. Did they actually say premature or did they just say denied? They say that they cannot say that the it's unconstitutional under the First Amendment as applied to the defendant in that scenario because there are still intent questions. That so the is, does say. that actually maybe suggest then that they did do an as applied challenge? It's just very hard for a defendant to win that because all you have is the indictment. That is a way that you could interpret it. It would, it would suggest that an as-applied challenge cannot succeed under the First Amendment because criminal, speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected. A well-pleaded indictment is going to demonstrate that speech that is pled as part of a criminal charge is integral to criminal conduct. And so there is no, there, there's nothing to decide if you're looking and you're cabined by the indictment. So we sort of have two routes here. Neither of them result in the grant of this of this motion. One says the court says this is premature. There's questions that have to be answered. Any First Amendment challenge has to happen after there's a factual record to look to. And the other says, OK, I can get to this today. It's not that I can't. I can. But there's nowhere to go because all of the speech is pled as integral to criminal conduct. And therefore, it's not protected by the First Amendment. You could you could envision an indictment. I don't know if I don't remember if Alvarez was a post trial or pre trial thing, but you could envision an indictment where perhaps they've drafted it to solely target speech because of its falsity or, or something like that. So maybe there's a use for an as-applied challenge in that kind of a situation. That's a fair point, Your Honor. It's just not the situation here. And sure. it's not going to be the situation in almost any case. That was a special case where, of course, you have a very unique statute that was punishing. That was, But that was really a facial challenge, too, because it was, it was saying, saying, like, this is just punishing <laughs> falsity for falsity's own sake. Yeah. None of the charges in this case are about that. They are about falsity employed as part of, or, or statements employed as part of a, a, a pattern of criminal conduct in, in numerous ways. So there's nowhere to go. And so I, I, think, I think it requires dismissal or denial at this stage because you either can't reach it because there's more fact, there's facts that have to be established or the indictment establishes that none of the speech is protected by the First Amendment. And the inquiry immediately ends. All right. Uh, all right, so back to you, Mr. Sadow. Uh, Let's let's move forward with the idea that we're making an as applied challenge solely confined to the indictment. Uh, this isn't a facial challenge. You're not saying any of these statutes are on this face Correct. unconstitutional. Uh, and your argument is that this is this is core political speech. Correct. Um, so some crimes can be achieved solely through speech, though. Terroristic That's threats, you know, crime. solicitation. Why is that not what's happening here, as alleged? Well, I think it requires kind of a detailed analysis, so if I may. Sure. All right, so the first thing we have to decide is whether or not, and we're talking about President Trump, we're not talking about the actions of others. We have to look and see whether or not that which has been alleged as facts is in fact 
poor political speech, political discourse, protect his speech at its zenith. I don't think there's any question that statements, comments, speech, expressive conduct that deals with campaigning or elections has always been found to be at the zenith of protected speech. Uh, what do we have here? We have election speech. So one must determine immediately whether that constitutes core political speech, and I suggest that it does. Now, does that make a difference? Ultimately, yes, because the more core speech, the more it is protected, the less the government should be involved in restricting it. I don't think there's any real doubt about that. So then the question becomes, is the mere fact that the state here represents that it is false or fraudulent under the statute, is that enough? Now, one I just heard, I think the state's position would be yes. All we have to do is say it's false, uh, it's integral to criminal conduct, it's fraud, and therefore it can't be unconstitutional as applied. I don't believe that that's what the law says. I think what the law really looks at is as to each individual application of a statute, whether or not the falsity in and of itself um, alone is sufficient. And I think the case law indicates that that's not so, particularly, and I don't need to go back through in detail everything that Alvarez said, but I think Alvarez is important because even when you talk in terms of, and I'll start with We're looking at the majority, what I would, I, actually, I guess it would be the plurality opinion that by Judge Kennedy, but for purposes of interest to us, the Chief Justice and Justice Sotomayor agree. So now we're talking about two people still on the court. Um, and I'm looking specifically at page 723 in which the court goes on to say, were the court to hold that the interest in truthful discourse alone is sufficient to sustain a ban on speech, absent any evidence that the speech would be used to gain a material advantage, it would give government a broad sensorial power unprecedented in this court's cases or in our constitutional tradition. So there, that's the beginning part of plurality saying the way to attack false speech or false political speech or core speech <clears throat> is with truth, which is precisely what was going on. We're talking about this time period without getting outside the indictment. You're talking about at the same time the allegations are being made, factual allegations in the indictment, you have others that are fighting that off. Government's position would be with truth, state's position with truth. Moving beyond Alvarez, that part of it, you have Justice Kagan with Justice Breyer. And, and here, I think, gets to the crux of where we are. And this is the concurring opinion. It goes through a, a litany of false statement cases in which the government's position in Alvarez is being false in and of itself is enough. That is, once you determine it's false, we're done. But that's not what the concurrent says, and that's not what the dissent says. The concurrent says, uh, basically, that these judicial statements cannot be read to mean no protection at all. False factual statements can serve useful human objectives, for example, in social contexts where they may prevent embarrassment, da, 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 in public contexts where they may stop or panic in the face of danger, and even in technical, philosophical, and scientific contexts where, as Socrates' method suggests, examination of a false statement, even if made deliberately to mislead, can promote a form of thought that ultimately helps realize the truth. Um, 
And then it goes on and says, even a false statement may be deemed to make a valuable contribution to public debate since it brings about the clear perception and the livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. So this is the proposition that it's not the falsity alone that controls. It's the context in which the speech is made. And if it is deemed false, and for purposes of the indictment, we have to assume that it is false, because that's what the facts have been alleged. That doesn't mean it's the end of the analysis. Why do we not also have to assume, since it's an allegation, I think you say in your brief, that it's unlawful, willful, and knowingly false? No, because at least the, our position, President Trump's position is, those are words are not words of fact. Those are words of legal connotation. And that, while they have meaning, uh, that would allow, for example, uh, let's go to Alvarez and the Stolen Valor Act. Just because they alleged that it was unlawful didn't mean it wins. That is, it doesn't mean that the government wins. But that's because they, they decided that wasn't a crime at all. I mean, that was a, a facial challenge where they said this statute, even if you violated it, violates the First Amendment. You've said that the RICO statute, you can violate it and not, you know, it's not a, right? It, so we make, we put legal conclusions and in, in indictments all the time. I think that's going to be part of Mr. Schaefer's argument in just a minute. Um, I mean, you said a moment ago, just because the state pleads it, you don't think that's enough in an as-applied challenge, and I'm trying to figure out as, as why. To the, as to <clears throat> statements such as legal conclusions are unlawful and so forth. Now, if there had been, I guess if the allegations had been broader, um, maybe we wouldn't be at that uh, crossroads, but those aren't facts. Uh, the facts, as I've outlined or we've outlined in our brief, you take the overt acts, you look at those overt acts, and then those, the same time, and then look at the substantive offenses or conspiracy offenses in the rest of the body of the indictment. Words like unlawful don't change that. Uh, at least that's our position. So now we're talking in terms, going back to Alvarez and the concurring opinion, you're talking in terms of falsity alone is not enough. There's stuff, there are situations, contexts, which override just the falsity alone. And that, again, the political discourse, the political speech, the, the, the more significant it is to certain issues, clearly being president of the United States at the time, dealing with elections and campaigning, calling into question whether what had occurred, at least in the election of 2020 for president, that's the height of political speech. And then you go even to the dissent, which I think is, um, as important because now you have Alito and Thomas and members of the current court. And I go to that. What I believe starts at page 751, um, and it says, even where there is wide scholarly, and this is 752, even there excuse me, even where there is a wide scholarly consensus concerning a particular matter, the truth is served by allowing that consensus to be challenged without fear of reprisal. Today's accepted wisdom sometimes turns out to be mistaken. And in these contexts, even a false statement may be, seen, may be deemed to make a valuable contribution to public debate since it brings about the clear perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. Uh, citing uh, Sup U.S. Supreme Court. That's the essence of what we have right here. That's the facts that have been alleged. Essentially, the state's position is because, as alleged, what President Trump said speech-wise or expressed either through um, his speech or conduct, which is still freedom of expression, because that's false in the eyes of the state, it's lost all protections of the First Amendment. 
and the concurring opinion and the dissenting opinion in Alvarez suggests just the opposite. If anything, under the circumstances, it needs more protection, not less protection. So keeping that in mind, let, let's move to not RICO. Put RICO aside for a minute. Let's move instead to the conspiracy counts, which are counts 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Basically, what the state's position is on that, because it took this position previously in its filing on September 27, 2023, in response to that which was filed by Chesbro. And I'm aware, of course, of the court's order that dealt with Chesbro, and it didn't deal with the as applied. So I'm dealing. It, well, and more so in that one, as I go back and look at it there was a much more kind of concerted effort to bring in facts outside of the indictment, right? And they started talking about, well, there was a transcript at the meeting, there was this, you know, so it, 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 it didn't really seem to be a true as-applied challenge, right? right? But, but as the court noted in its order, <laughs> at that point it didn't determine that it was ripe for a pretrial challenge. So I'm taking what Chesbro, what the state said, as it applies now, because it says in that brief that it, was both as to facial and as applied challenges. Essentially what it says is, um, as to the, count, those counts, 9, 11, um, 13, 15, 17, 19, as to 9, 11, and 17, the mere fact that it alleges a fraud is enough. That is, that's what's on page five and page six. Um, since each of those statutes prohibit conduct involving fraud, we don't go any further, and I'm suggesting that's wrong, that you must go further. You must look at the speech itself, the expressive conduct itself, in connection with those specific statutes. That's what the as-applied is. The fact that it's a fraudulent statute, now you want to look and see why, under the circumstances here, the language speech of the president falls within that. And if you look at it in that sense, the mere fact that it's false is all that they have. They don't, there's not a finding that the speech itself, beyond the speech itself, is fraudulent. What the state wants to do is say, we have a goal. We have an objective here that we have put forward. Steal the election in an unlawful fashion. I say, change that for a second to legitimate concern about the validity of the election. If that was the way you focused on it, which is a way to do it as applied, even with the facts, would what President Trump said on those counts be a protected speech? And the answer is it has to be, because the only thing that makes it fraudulent is the state saying it's false. Take every one of those and say, OK, it's not false. It's protected. The only reason it becomes unprotected, in the state's opinion, is because they call it false. And that's what Alvarez doesn't allow. In and of itself, it cannot be simply the content-based. It has to be contextual. And the contextual here is a political core value being addressed, elections and campaigning. And that holds true for the all of those that deal with the, the conspiracy. And then you deal with counts 29 and 39, which is the false statements charges. Now, it is clear that the Supreme Court would find that a statement made under 1001, 18 U.S.C. 1001, would constitute the appropriate, um, let's say, abridgment or non-protected uh, conduct or speech. But Georgia's statute's a little different here, because we don't have a materiality element. It's the mere fact of falsity which violates, according to Georgia law, counts 29 and 39. You don't have to do anything else but make a false statement, even if it is political discourse, even if it is in the heightened uh, context that I've suggested. If it's false, it's a violation of the law. And I'm saying as applied to political speech, that can't be constitutional as applied. Remember, 
No materiality, simply the fact that he said it. So essentially, what the state's position on that would be, it didn't have to be sent to um, anyone of consequence in the state agency. It just had to be said. Uh, indeed, if you look at, and, and the most in, probably best example is count 39, that's a letter written after the election in September of 2021 from President Trump to um, Secretary of State in which it has, according to that, one statement. And that constitutes, according to the state, falsity, but it's clearly political speech. And it's clearly being related to the activities and uh, the, the matters that of election and campaign, even after the fact, it's still related just to that. So looking at 29 and 39, I think you have a situation in which the falsity alone is all they have as applied here to political speech. It is unconstitutional as applied under the First Amendment. And then finally, you have count 27. Quick question which, on that. Had, had you, uh, I hadn't located one. Had you found a, anyone ever attempted a facial challenge on 161020? Yeah, in, in fact, I don't remember the name of the case, but it has been upheld, um, even though there was references to the fact that maybe materiality should be part of it. That's got to be the... Yeah, Haley. Haley case. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. Okay. So, yes, facially, yes. But Haley, of course, didn't go to the extent of trying to determine sure. as applied in a particular context. And it's, um, again, I don't wish to repeat what I just said, but here we're talking about the heightened value of core political speech. And then with 27, we're talking about the filing of a false document. Again, the only thing there that involves President Trump is an attestation uh, on the uh, complaint. Now, all it refers to in the indictment is complaint. But again, we're talking about the act, the falsity or the filing of false document is the falsity in the document itself. And I'm suggesting under the circumstances that and that alone wouldn't violate that statute as applied. So regardless of the facial challenges, the question becomes here, is the mere fact that the state says fraud or false statement enough to get by an as-applied challenge. And our suggestion is it is not. Now let's go to RICO. And I think RICO is more difficult, to be honest with you, because we're talking about a much broader statute. At the same time, when you look at the allegations against President Trump, all of the allegations, all of the allegations involved expressive conduct or speech. We have false statements alleged in overt acts, and again, all of which are political core value, political discourse. You have false statements in overt acts one, <coughs> five, seven, eight, 17, 93, 97, 108, 113, 133, 135, and 157. Purely, the only allegations there are falsity. There, there's no allegation beyond the fact that those statements are made. And I'm suggesting that, again, heightened political speech has to be looked at differently. When it comes to tweets, which is, at least the, the way the state sets it forth, is also political speech, uh, and here certainly by the then President of the United States, you have tweets in 22, 26, 27, 32, 75, 100, 101, 106, 114, 128, 138, and 139. So the majority of the overt acts involve false statements or tweets, which are clearly political speech. How best to deal with that under the circumstances? To prosecute those under a broad RICO charge, supposedly with uh, contesting an election by, I guess, illegitimate speech or expressive conduct? Or is the way that we are set up as a country is that the First Amendment plays through this by others, by those that are complaining that it's false, proving it's false, bringing forth the truth. That's the essence of what Alvarez has said. That's the essence of what um, a case called Brown versus Hartledge 
which is cited in Alvarez. It's 456 U.S. 45 at 61, a 1982 decision. All of those speak in terms of when you're dealing with that speech, that political speech, you're best to deal with it through the per pushing forth a counter view of truth, not not prosecuting the speech maker or the person that is articulating his political views. Uh, here we've, we've done just the opposite. Uh, we have decided that because those views were unpopular and in state's opinion false, we must prosecute them to stop them from happening again, which is, again, the essence of why it's unconstitutional as applied, because that's not what the law says. Finally, the rest of the overt acts, either the telephone calls or meetings or requests, no false statements. They're just acts, expressive acts. And they're in there as well. Those are political acts. And for the court's benefit, because I know there's a lot of overt acts, those are 9, 14, 19, 28, 30, 31, 40, 42, 43, 44, 90, 95, 112, uh, what was in the old indictment is 123, paragraph or number two is now, I think, is 125, 130, 131, 140, and 156. There is nothing alleged factually against President Trump that is not political speech. So what this court has to decide is, is the state's position that it fraud or false statements under these circumstances, which I suggest really is alone, is that enough um, to get it by an as-applied challenge? Our position is it's not. Is there another way to look at this? They're going to argue at the same time that it's integral to criminal conduct. But it's the speech that's being punished. That is the criminal conduct. If it's not the criminal conduct, there would never be an indictment for the RICO against President Trump or any of these other counts. Take out the political speech, no criminal charges. Political speech uh, disagreed with, basis for all charges. Uh, I, I think that is the best way for me to sum up where our position is. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sadow. All right, Mr. Wakeford or Mr. Floyd, if, if there are any points that you wanted to address or respond to. Um, I mean, well, I'll start, maybe I'll start you off with this. It, it certainly seems that the primary case driving Mr. Sadow's argument would be Alvarez. And, you know, because that's a fractured kind of plurality opinion, I'm wondering if if you have any thoughts on just how much that can drive this. And I know the state back in December was also citing Alvarez as the primary case. I wonder if that's even the best one well, for your arguments. I think um, to address the first, I think, elephant in this courtroom um, is that a, uh, a Judge Chotkin in D.C. has evaluated all of these arguments. Uh, under Supreme Court precedent already. Um, so I would refer, Your Honor, to the court's analysis because I'm hardly going to uh, improve upon the findings of a federal judge. However, um, speaking specifically to Alvarez, the, the, it is a plurality opinion with uh, several different concurring, several, several different opinions written by other justices. What they all agree on, though, is that Alvarez doesn't change the law that speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected under the First Amendment and that that's not what Alvarez was about. It was about punishing falsity for its own sake. So the question is, is that what the state is doing here? And by fundamentally rewriting the indictment, um, the defendant is suggesting today that that is somehow what the state is doing, when actually what the state is saying is that these statements made by the defendant were all employed as part of criminal activity, various conspiracies, frauds, intentions with deceit and violations of the law. It's not just that they were false. It's not that the defendant has been hauled into a courtroom because the prosecution doesn't like what he said. He is free to say, to say, to make statements and to file lawsuits and to make other legitimate protests. What he is not allowed to do is employ his speech and his expression and his statements as part of a criminal conspiracy to violate Georgia's RICO statute, to impersonate public officers, to file false documents, and to, to make false statements to the government. That's what he's alleged to do. It's never, it's, he's not charged under 161020 because he told some lies 
um, although it is very interesting to hear counsel for, the, for Mr. Trump uh, tell us about the usefulness of lies. He's not being prosecuted for lying. He's being prosecuted for lying to the government, a state, uh, an act which is illegal because it does harm to the government. That's the reason that it's illegal. That's why it's different from the statute evaluated in Alvarez. Same thing with filing a false document. It's not just that you, you made a false statement. It's that you swore to it in a court document and submitted it to the court. That does harm to the judicial system. That's obviously different from just falsity being punished for its own sake. And that is what each and every charge in the indictment demonstrates, is that these statements are part of criminal conduct that is larger than just the false statement on its own. Especially with the RICO charge, where what we see is that this is a, a, a criminal organization whose members and associates engaged in various criminal activities, but including but not limited to false statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, and on and on and on. What, what the defendant is suggesting to your honor is, is trying to get around to the fact that because it's, it's almost saying that because these statements are false, that these charges should be dismissed. It's, it's like, well, we, you can't punish falsity on its own, and yet each time you look at the charge, the government's saying, the state is saying that he lied. So that must be the, the end of the inquiry. But that's not the end of the inquiry at all. That's not what the indictment says. It's not just that he lied over and over and over again, as counsel for the defendant points out by listing all of the instances in the indictment, is that each of those was employed as part of criminal activity with criminal intentions. And we finally get to a place where, he's, it, it's, it, where I knew we would end up, which is saying, I believe your honor was requested to think about it as, not as lies, but as legitimate concern about election issues. Well, that sounds like a trial argument to me. But this is why I began by talking about intent with your honor, because I knew we were going to end up in this exact place where he said, sure, you can look at them as lies because they weren't true, or you could think this is just well-intentioned concerns from an American citizen speaking his mind. And that, of course, would probably be a pretty good argument to put before a jury, and I expect we will see it, but it's not a basis for dismissing the indictment. The whole question of intent is, is no doubt going to be brought up. It can only be determined by a jury. But what we have heard here today is an attempt to rewrite the indictment, to take out the parts that are inconvenient and only say, well, it's all speech, it's all talking, and he was just a guy asking questions, <laughs> and not someone who was part of an overarching criminal conspiracy trying to overturn election results for an election he did not win by violating the RICO statute, by making false statements to the government, by filing false documents, by impersonating officers, and doing a whole host of other activity which is harmful in addition to the falsity of the statements employed to make them happen. So I think there's been a suggestion that Your Honor can sort of reframe what you're looking at, but Alvarez does nothing to shift the basis that the court should stand upon when evaluating the indictment. And that is to say, is this, is this speech being punished solely because it's false, solely because of its viewpoint? Or is it speech that's being demonstrated as integral to a pattern of criminal activity? And finally, the, the fact that it speaks to political concerns or core political speech, and this is something that the, the court in D.C. Uh, thoroughly addressed, does not change the fact that it can be employed as part of criminal conduct. It's the mere fact that you're talking about issues of public concern or core, pol core political speech, which may be completely fine and protected in certain, in most contexts, does not mean that you cannot be indicted if you use that kind of speech to pursue illegal activities. That's, that's the whole nature of the question. So it's very circular, and, and I would direct your honor to page six to seven of, of the post hearing brief followed by Defendant Trump, which says, the speech integral to criminal conduct exception of the First Amendment does not apply here because all the charge conduct constitutes First Amendment protected speech. That is a very neat circle. The First Amendment protects us because all the speech is protected by the First Amendment. And in the end, no matter how much we hear about the, uh, obviously the noble protections afforded by the First Amendment, all of this is an effort to get your honor not to look at the basic fact
that this speech, this expression, all this activity is employed as part of a pattern of criminal conduct in a host of ways. And because Your Honor is bound by the indictment and has to look at the indictment and can't look beyond it, if we're going to get into this at this stage, then there's nowhere to go, as I said at the beginning, because this is all alleged as part of a pattern of criminal conduct and not protected by the First Amendment. Any argument to the other, otherwise is just to try to pretend like that's not true. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wakeman. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I add one point briefly? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Wait a second. We're being doubled up on here? This, this is this not, not a trial. I think you can handle it, Mr. Sadow. Uh, and this is, I'm just going to be on one specific point, not duplicate the argument made before. Um, I, I believe Defendant Trump fundamentally misunderstands the role of an overt act in a conspiracy case. As we've discussed many times previously, this is a RICO conspiracy case. And so we heard Mr. Sadow discuss various overt acts and say, well, but this is just a tweet. This is just a phone call. This is just X. The unspoken underlying and incorrect premise then is that every overt act must be a crime. As we've discussed a number of times, and as the state has set forth extensively in multiple briefs, that's not true. Uh, the purpose of an overt act is to show that the conspiracy is an operation. It is not a separate crime. It doesn't have to satisfy the elements. It doesn't have to be pled with that level of detail, as Your Honor acknowledged in an order, I think, that's all of two weeks old. Um, and so to say we can't mention this particular act or this particular conduct because it's not a crime or it's protected by the First Amendment, the answer to that is actually, so what? Because it could be first, it could be legal conduct, it could be First Amendment <clears throat> protected conduct. That also shows there's a conspiracy in operation, and that's as long as it serves that purpose, it's fine. And so, overt acts should not be examined by a standard that has no application to them. They are not separate freestanding offenses. Um, and there is federal case law that, and if need be, we can cite it to you that has said an overt act can involve First Amendment activity. Its purpose is not to be something that is separately charged here, separately subject to a separate sentence. Its purpose is to show that there is a conspiracy and it's an operation. Um, Georgia requires, Georgia RICO requires one overt act by any one defendant. So of course the RICO would stand if anything, any of the 161 overt acts uh, alleged constituted an overt act. It would only take one. It doesn't take any by Mr. Trump. Um, but the point is, we have an abundance of them by Mr. Trump, and for purposes of the RICO statute and the manner in which it functions, it doesn't matter whether that's First Amendment conduct or not. I mean, we've my colleague has fully explained why much of this conduct is not shielded under any circumstance by the First Amendment, and I don't mean to contradict that in any respect. But it's important not to lose sight of the function the Overt Act plays, the role it plays in a conspiracy case here, because it is not the role being suggested by Defendant Trump. All right. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. All right, Mr. Sid, I'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, final word. Thank you, sir. If I heard what Mr. Floyd just said, that if everything President Trump said was assumed true and included in the RICO indictment, and therefore now we're talking about true political speech, not alleged false, he could still be prosecuted for the violation of RICO. But the overt acts as alleged, let's say even the overt acts uh, ran afoul of the First Amendment saying that wouldn't be fatal to count one because at that point if if they if there could the be some other thing they prove that's not alleged as an overt act okay that that may as, as be, i understand it. It, it as as i understood it as well but what i'm suggesting is if all of the overt acts are nothing more than core political speech or expressive conduct and nothing else is alleged which is not protected by the First Amendment, then you have an insufficient basis for which he has been indicted, because he's being indicted for First Amendment uh, speech and not for unprotected speech. And therefore, the statement that was made about if it were true, we could still use it as an overt act, uh, suggests 
that they can prosecute <coughs> true speech, um, which is what we're trying to get to here. It's the nature of the speech, the political speech, the heightened value of such, which gets this situation different than others, and the fact that it comes from then President of the United States. Uh, going back to what was said in addition by the state, what the state claims is criminal here is lying to the government. That's what it said. That's the exact reason why, in several of the Supreme Court cases, it's been found to be protected speech, because it deals with the government and falsity in the in sense of communication uh, with or to the government is best dealt with through true speech, not through prosecutions, in, because prosecutions chill speech. And when it comes to political core speech, what you don't want is chilled. Uh, I use, uh, fortunately, I have a, a co-counsel that is able to pull things up and, and help me inform the court uh, until the computer shuts down. Uh, and looking at what Haley says, just to give you an idea of how the Georgia court, the Supreme Court, might look at this. There's a quote from Haley, and it says, while there is no constitutional value in false statements of fact, such erroneous statements are nevertheless inevitable in free debate, and punishment of error runs the risk of inducing a cautious and restrictive exercise of the constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech and press. Accordingly, the First Amendment requires that we protect some falsehood in order to protect speech that matters. And I think that's what we're talking about here. To end this, and again, we're focusing on um, President Trump's conduct that at the time that he, in fact, is the head of the executive branch. Uh -uh. There is references to this in Brown v. Hartwich, and I cited that earlier. A well-publicized yet bogus complaint on election eve raises the concerns, that is, raises the concerns that you may have some impact that would affect an election. But, but the preferred First Amendment remedy of more speech, not enforced silence, has special force. Uh, underlying our dependence upon more speech is the presupposition the right conclusions are more likely to be gathered out of a multitude of tongues than through any kind of authoritative selection. To many, this is and always will be folly, but we have staked upon it all. And for speech concerning public affairs is more than self-expression, it is the essence of self-government. And that comes from Garrison v. Louisiana, which is cited also in Alvarez. Bottom line here is this. But for protected First Amendment speech, President Trump would not be charged in RICO or the other counts. Take out the protected speech, and you don't have an underlying basis for which to charge him. And since that violates the Constitution as applied to the charges here and his speech here and his position here, this is ripe for a constitutional challenge. One step further. If it's not ripe now and we get into intent, when does the court determine that? Do you determine that after we have a trial? I think it would be the directed verdict stage. Well, right? but would it? In that's all, a sufficiency all, of evidence. With all inferences, yeah, in favor that's of the state. A, that's a whole question. I mean, do we go through the whole trial? God forbid there should be a conviction, and then we go back to trying to determine as applied? Uh, I'm suggesting the reason it's ripe now and the reason <laughs> why we don't even get to a trial is because it's unconstitutional to force an accused be it the president of the United States, former president, or anyone else, to stand trial on protected speech. Um, and I think that's what Alvarez and the progeny previous to that and after uh, say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stato. All right. Uh, Mr. Gillen, do you need a minute before we dive in, or can we get started? Uh, no, we're, we're pretty good. Okay. So just teeing this one up, <clears throat> uh, I know there's a good bit of the your motion that goes back into a lot of ground I think we covered at the December hearing. Well, or, excuse uh, me, the... let me start off with some good news for the court. Uh -oh. 
I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. See the smile already on the court's All right, face. Well, consciously, uh, I, I, the, the, our, uh, our gentle and, and specific demur, a great deal of that does go into uh, the areas of RICO that the court has right. not only ruled on, but heard other arguments. Well, I haven't ruled on it yet, but it was just well, we uh, talked about continuity. Well, I think it was a ruling in, the, in October, the sure. 17th ruling addresses a lot, some of the issues that, that were addressed. Uh, so I'm not going to um, I'm not going to I'm not going to redo replow that ground that uh, the court has heard you know I'm aware of the, of the government's position I know that probably ruined uh, Mr. Floyd's day by not allowing <laughs> him to uh, get up and go back over uh, his in his uh, RICO expertise I'm not going to do that what I'd like to do though today. Is, uh, is to move forward to some areas that I do think needs to be, and the question really when the court said, do we want to have oral arguments today or not? And then the question was, well, you know, because on the RICO thing, I think I probably could have said, if it was just the RICO component, I would have said, fine, let's just uh, do it on the papers. You've got a lot of other counts. Those are some other things that I wanted to talk about and have the court focus on uh, as it relates to, uh, to um, some of the other aspects of the uh, the the demurs, special and general demurs, and and to focus on that in 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 this way. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about some of the counts impersonating public officers. I want to talk about the forgery, the false statements, uh, briefly, and talk about that. But also, I, I, to 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 raise this issue with the court. Now, uh, we we argue that in our in our uh, 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 pleadings. But the defendant still filed uh, additional motions on these very issues and did a very, very good job in a lot of his arguments. We know that the court granted the stay for uh, defendant still because he's of the state legislature, and thus, uh, you know, had that not happened, Mr. Beaver would be here with me talking about these issues. I think that the still pleading uh, addressed a lot of the issues that were raised in the in the response by the by the state, and so uh, with uh, with uh, the you know forgiveness, hopefully, of my dear friend Mr. Beaver, uh, I'm going to mention some of the things that they mentioned. But I would hope uh, on 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 behalf of of defendants still, the court may listen to what I say, but also prior to ruling on these particular issues, might uh, afford defendants still the opportunity to have his own oral argument day so that he could more uh, fully address these issues. And that's, uh, and I would appreciate uh, that on, on his behalf. When we talk, uh, let's, let's get on to it. Uh, we're talking about impersonating a public officer charge, and we talk about that. When we talked about that, we talked about whether or not, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the charge. Definition of public officer, right? Yeah, uh, impersonating a public officer charge, count eight. Uh, we say that's subject to dismissal. Uh, you know, in that pertinent part, it says on October the 14th, on or about December 2022, unlawfully falsely held themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia public officers with the intent uh, to mislead. Now, what we did in our in our pleading is we said, well, uh, that has is defective because. Uh, under the statute uh, 21-5-1, uh, as public officer, there is no reference there to uh, presidential electors as not uh, as being public officers, and therefore uh, it should that that should carry the day for us. The state's response uh, says, "Well, not so fast, Mr. Gillen. Uh, we've got uh, cases here that talk about." Situations which, in which twenty-one five one doesn't carry the day and isn't well, not even cases. I mean the statute itself. Right. I mean you're, you're pulling that from the ethics statute. Exactly. So I'm not really sure why I'd even look at that. I so, mean, public so, officers all throughout the code, and it's just kind of one of those hanging kind of question marks, I suppose. So what the state does, and you know, and I and, and I can see the court's point. I'm not going to argue that. Uh, what I am going to say is that what they say, they cite cases where there are where are there are individuals. Uh, that are impersonating agents, you know, police officers, peace officers, uh, or agents for Metro Atlanta hum uh, Human Trafficking Task Force. Okay, that falls into that category. Trafficking uh, 
uh, in, uh, in the task force or a federal agent. Those are things that the state responds to. I think that, that in the still uh, motion, it covers some of the concerns the court may have regarding this issue of public officer and why we think that we should prevail on this as well. Again, hoping Mr. Beaver has his day. Well, well do me the favor, actually, I've kind of put the still motions in a box and I haven't opened it yet, so make those arguments <laughs> for me. Well, I'm going to, All right. uh, but not as, not as articulately, I'm sure, as, as Tom would, could do it, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the flavor. The flavor uh, of it is that in the still motion, which we adopted uh, uh, as, uh, after it was filed, it talks about how other, uh, other uh, uh, case law in Georgia, when it talks about about, first of all, 1610.23 doesn't define public officer. So we start from that, pro, that, so we've got that out there. Doesn't not defining the public officer. Now, but, but the still pleading does say that the, the issue of what, who is and is not a public officer is addressed in other, in other uh, contexts in Georgia uh, uh, law. Usually in the uh, quo uh, merito proceedings where somebody is trying to find out the legitimacy of somebody having or holding a particular office. And in that context, uh, there are cases citing uh, in, the, in the still pleading uh, that uh, address this very matter. Uh, they cite uh, Brown v. Scott uh, and uh, as, a, as a case in which the, uh, the Brown v. Scott case uh, you know, whether or not an individual has designation or title given to him by law or exercises functions concerning the public assigned to him by the law, they cite Brown. That doesn't, the, the inquiry doesn't really end there. Uh, the, the, the George Supreme Court has termed, noted the term public officer involves the idea of tenure, <coughs> duration, fees, emoluments, and powers, as well as that of duty. And so that's uh, McDuffie v. Uh, Perguson, and that uh, has to do really with grand jurors. So when someone says, well, is a grand juror a, a public officer? And uh, the court you know, breaks down an analysis talking about that, saying not really because grand, ju uh, gr grand jurors may only meet for a few days. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're not there for some sort of duration or tenure. Uh, they don't take the same oath of office as prescribed for uh, public officers. <coughs> and they lack the element of tenure and duration which must exist to qualify as a public officer. Okay. Well, so how would that apply again to like a purely fictional task force? Well, I mean, let's forget the purely fictional task force. It would uh, let's have it that that case law from the, from our Supreme Court how it applies uh, to our case and how it applies to our cases. The presidential electors uh, are not people who have uh, a lengthy tenure duration, which it must exist. Frankly, their job is to meet for one day. No, I, 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 I see your, your framework there, but if the framework is actually in this, whereas the Metro Atlanta Human, Human Trafficking Force, it doesn't even exist. Well, it doesn't. We but someone is pretending to be someone is pretending to be an agent. Maybe and they're a part-time. I mean, it just—it seems like if I, you, well, you, you see, know what I mean. We might agree yeah. to disagree here because I think that when you're when when someone says, uh, "Well, I'm here's my badge. I'm an I'm an I'm a I'm a uh, an agent uh, of uh, enforcement of the law for," and then names a particular entity that doesn't even exist. They're pretending to be a peace officer. They're pretending to be an agent for the government, which, by the very nature of that job would have tenure, would have responsibilities, yeah. would fall into the definition that the Supreme Court has given uh, in Brown v. Scott and McDuffie v. Pearson as to what a public uh, officer should be. And so uh, in that context, uh, we have, you know, uh, we have uh, and same thing actually, you know, it, it popped up again on the issue of, of, uh, of uh, in Morrissey Peters, Another case, Supreme Court case, dealing with whether or not someone is a public officer, that had to do with uh, uh, a, a, a quo warranto against the chairman of the, uh, of the Georgia Democratic Party <coughs> and whether or not uh, he would fall in as a public officer. Bottom lining it, 
like in, in, in that case, and which uh, found that he was not, like, the, like grand jurors and public official, party officials, presidential electors are not public officials under Georgia law, especially for purposes of 161023. Uh, their jobs, services are temporary, like the grand juries. Uh, they, uh, they, their position really only arises once every four years, is limited to a single meeting uh, on, a, on a single day. So it lacks that element of tenure and duration uh, which must exist. So, uh, you, know, it, it's, you know, it's kind of like back to the, the political case, Morris v. Peters case, which dealt with the state party uh, political uh, uh, chairman, uh, nominated in accordance with the rules of their party. But just because of the fact that they were nominated by the rules of their party doesn't make them a public official. Uh, so, and, and like grand jurors, presidential electors don't receive, they're not receiving their salaries for their service. So all of that, Your Honor, tells us uh, that, that uh, the, you know, this particular uh, count uh, is flawed for the, for the very purpose of these, uh, these electors cannot be under Georgia law uh, you know, public officers. And so, uh, you know, it, we, we, although we agree with the court's initial position regarding, uh, regarding the limitation on, on the definition of public officer in our pleading, uh, good old Tom Beaver and the still pleading has come forward to uh, rescue us on that point. And so if you, if you look at what they did, and hopefully Tom will do a better job of articulating those points, in their pleading they talk about specifically some, some other cases that uh, get into either in Texas and, and, and I think Utah as well that deal more specifically with this. But for the purposes of argument today, I think that we've sort of got the drift on, on what what I think uh, uh, is uh, is happening on the impersonation of public officers. They're not public officers. And clearly, under the direction we believe of, the, of our Supreme Court, they could not be so judged. Now, uh, again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time up here with the court. Uh, but I do want to touch on a few of the other components of our of our pleading, uh, the forgery counts. Now, the you know we indicated in those counts ten and sixteen are sufficient to dismissal. Uh, you know, writing a, a check in a fictitious name or a manner that the writing is made or altered purports to have been made by another person. That's the definition of, of sixteen ten. We have uh, what we have here. Uh, in, 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 in this indictment is we have an assertion that a writing or other, other than a check in a manner that the writing has made purports to be made by authority of the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia who did not give such authority. Now, that's what they allege. Let's break that down as to why um, and the state's response to us saying they want to focus on the on the phrase under the authority uh, and what we have here is the concept of what is uh, uh, what is the authority who is who is this on October the 14th who was the uh, duly it's uh, excuse me the, who's the, the duly elected and qualified presidential elector from the state of Georgia who did not give such authority on December the 14th, 2020. Now, the, the answer to that is that as it is as, as a matter of law, simply as a matter of law, and we're now we're going back, Your Honor, to some of the arguments we've made with the court earlier on the issue of supremacy uh, clause were worthy of at least highlighting some of those points to the court uh, for, for the purpose of making our point here. And that is this, that, um, you know, be, uh, under the, uh, the federal law, uh, as it existed in 2020, when the state of Georgia failed, 
failed to comply with federal law about having an adjudication of any pending controversy or litigation. And as we know, in the public record in this courthouse was the pending and unresolved Trump and Schaefer litigation on the election. Now, because that lawsuit was not adjudicated pursuant to federal law, then the state of Georgia lost its ability on uh, after Safe Harbor Day, lost its ability to then name who the, uh, the electors should be. And as we discussed earlier, and I'll shorten the uh, argument, but for the say, purpose of the record, I'll just make the following points. Once that happens, and it's very, very clear from, from, from federal law and from the, uh, the, the, the language from Bush v. Gore, the state, any Sending opinion of Bush v. Gore. Yeah, true. Uh, but, but as it points there, it's like it's not, they see it as not even a, a serious issue because uh, the clear reading of the statute would say if you don't get it done by Safe Harbor Day, uh, then you have lost out, uh, and once that happens, the power then shifts back to the Congress. So, as of by law, we think not you know, not not a factual issue. By law, on December the fourteenth, twenty twenty, there were no there were no duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the from uh, from the state of Georgia because of that failure. And so understand your point, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but since we're in demur world here, wouldn't your allegation of whether a lawsuit was filed, whether it was pending, no, that's an indictment. Doesn't that transform this into a speaking demur? Well, we, we, we don't think so. And the reason why we, we don't is the last, the last time I think we quoted the court that the court could take a notice of the pleadings within the, within the court system. And I believe that what we are articulated there, and I don't think we had an objection from the state, <laughs> could be wrong, but my recollection is we didn't, that we then, then, we, we then work from the framework of, yes, uh, in this courthouse, there was a, a filing, a pleading, uh, that we're not going, this isn't a speaking to Murr, it's a part of the court record. Part of the court record says there was a lawsuit that was not adjudicated by Safe Harbor Day. So we don't have to go outside the indictment. It's not a speaking to Murr. And because of that, by applying the law, this, uh, these uh, forgery counts, 10 and 16, in our view, must go. Uh, now, the other counts that I would like to, uh, or the other matter I'd like to discuss, is the false statement component. Uh, and uh, uh, on, uh, on the false statement counts is that 14? of 12, 18, and 40, uh, dealing with false statement. Now, here, uh, the, the issue here dealing with a false statement, for example, uh, is when they're asserting that we, that there was a, a document within, that was sent within the jurisdiction of the Office of the Georgia Secretary of State and the Officer of the Governor of Georgia, Departments and Agencies of the Government. Now, uh, we've got two arguments to that. Number one, uh, and again, back to Haley. Haley talks about uh, this issue, and when Haley talks about it, the key thing is whether or not uh, there was agency with a th w the key phrase with authority to act on it. Now, uh, there there are two flaws, the fatal flaws the state has as it relates to this issue concerning Haley v. State, and on the issue concerning. Uh, uh, the, the 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 safe harbor. One, uh, as we mentioned, uh, the the uh, at that time there was nothing for the state of Georgia to act upon. Uh, they merely received the information. It was merely a well, sort of a, a um, ministerial act, if you would. But even more fatal to their argument is the second argument that I made. A moment ago, which I won't repeat, other uh, other than referencing it, the failure, the failure uh, to act by Safe Harbor date 
renders any act activity on behalf of the state of Georgia, be it the governor or the secretary of state, renders that gone. Because now it's all gone back up to Washington, to Congress, to deal with that. And the government in the, in the state can't now say or at any time say, well, uh, we're saying that the, that the, the Democratic uh, uh, nominees or the Democratic representatives for the electors, they ultimately became the duly elected. You don't do that. You don't retro uh, parachute back into what happened on December the 14th. The world as we know it on December the 14th, there were neither Democrat or Republicans that were duly elected under federal law. And so, given that, we believe that the false statement uh, uh, counts should, uh, should go. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Okay, any thoughts from the state in reaction? Mr. Wooten, this one's yours. <clears throat> yes, Judge. Let, let me pick it up on that last point, because I know we've, 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 we've died into some of this, not so much the safe harbor aspect of it and that argument, but the idea that the governor's office and the secretary of state's office just didn't have jurisdiction. Um, I know you've said that that's an issue of fact that needs to be proven, but isn't that also something that could be shown by as a matter of law, potentially? Um, and I Judge, know you don't agree it is, and so you can cover all that. Sure, sure. I don't agree that it's a matter of law. I, it is an issue of fact. Um, and we've briefed this extensively and argued this before. We believe that even if it's not an issue of fact, even if the court were to consider it as a matter of law, we've given uh, ample reasons why under statute all of these entities have jurisdiction over um, many of the crimes that are alleged in the indictment, many of the topics that, well, all of the topics uh, where we've alleged that some of these defendants have made false statements um, regarding. So. I do maintain that I believe that it's, a, it's an issue of fact for the jury to decide that we have to put up that evidence. We have to ask the GBI officers, you know, what is your duty? What is, what is your authority? What can you investigate? We have to ask the Secretary of State off, uh, individuals while they're on the stand, what, is, what are your duties? What is your job? What do you do? Why are these things relevant? Why are these material to, to areas where you have jurisdiction to do something? What is your ability to act on these things? I think all of that has to come out at trial. And so as it relates to that argument, I, I think it's way premature. Um, and anything that, that, again, I always go back to the standard for what is a demur, right? Right. But, but uh, what I'm saying, just if there was a statute that explicitly, you know, said that they didn't have jurisdiction. But remind me, uh, what, what, what is it that you're saying, just as a matter of law as a parent, that provides the governor authority over this after the, um, the safe harbor day? Judge, I don't have the indictment in front of me, so I'd need to know specifically what, state, uh, That's what statement we're talking I think, I mean, I think, I think this is in regard to the, sure. um, the, the certificates or, or the paperwork where, you know, if an elector doesn't show up on Election Day or on December 14th, that the governor has to ratify a replacement of that person. Um, I think there were some documents that, that were delivered uh, by Mr. Schaefer and his co-conspirators to the governor's office okay. trying to get the governor to do that. That's provided by statute that the governor, the governor's the one that has to ratify a replacement. So statutorily, he absolutely has the authority to act on uh, on that matter. Okay. All right. So I, I, but um, from the top, uh, I think there was a lot of time spent on definition of public officer and some of the allegations raised in the um, Mr. Still's briefing, which I think his motion deadline should be coming up soon, so we'll, he'll, if he's requesting argument, we'd have him in. Sure. Um, but if you want to make any initial um, reactions, add a well prepared judge. Right. Um, first, I want to kind of I've, I've made this statement uh, in the past as it relates to Mr. Schaefer, and I'll make it again, which is we have to address an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is that Mr. Schaefer is in the 11th Circuit right now, demanding to be recognized as a federal officer. So. What are what are we? I mean, are we saying that, that this position of elector is an officer or isn't? I think they need to make up their mind there. Um, but as it relates to, well, I've actually got quite a bit of ground to cover, and I'll kind of take it as it was as it was raised uh, by Mr. Gillen. I want to start with, and again, as we pointed out in our response, we don't believe that the definition section um, in yeah, twenty one five three applies. I think you've conceded that, so. But, Judge, if it did apply, I think it actually supports us. Because if you look at paragraph B, uh, this is uh, 215322B2, 
B, it says public officer means every other elected state official not listed in subparagraph A. So it's a comprehensive definition of any elected state official. So we believe that that would absolutely cover it to the extent that it's persuasive that it shows that, that, that presidential electors are public officers. That definition says any elected state official. So they are elected state officials. Um, I want to hit briefly on the cases that were raised by Mr. Gillen uh, as it relates to what Mr. Still put in his pleadings, prepared to address those. Um, first, there was, there was an intimation that 1610.23 only applies to police officers or peace officers. We know that that's not true because of a case called Kennedy versus Carlton. That's 294 Georgia 576. Uh, 2014 Georgia Supreme Court case where a conviction was upheld for someone impersonating an, a DFAX employee, clearly not a, a police officer, a peace officer of any kind. So we can we can dispense with that argument. Um, as it relates to the cases that, that Mr. Gillen referenced, um, you know, the definition of public officer in other contexts, all of those cases deal with the definition of public officer for the in the context of a petition for uh, Quo Rento. Um, three, I believe there's three cases that are referenced in, in, in Mr. Still's pleading. We're filing our response to that tomorrow, but I can kind of take them in turn. Um, Mr. Gillen referenced this list of, of qualifications in the McDuffie case, tenure, emoluments, duties, et cetera. That's not the holding of McDuffie. So the way that, that the McDuffie case is structured is the Georgia Supreme Court says, no one's ever definitively said what a public officer is in the context of quo rento. Well, look, if you're if you're uh, about to file a response and, and but Mr. Beaver may be requesting oral argument, why don't we just save it for when I've had sure, a chance to sure. read I, these cases and then we can be more productive. Sure, I can point. skip those cases, yeah. but I did want to hit a few points, Judge, as it relates to the statutes that establish that, that presidential electors are public officers. Um, first of all, the actual office itself is created by law. So it's created by the, Consti the United States Constitution, um, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, and it's also created by uh, OCGA 21-2-10. That actually establishes that there is a, an office of presidential elector in this state. Um, they have duties that are established by law. Those are established both in the U.S. Constitution in the 12th Amendment, as well as at OCGA 21-2-11. Um, by law, they're elected by the public, 21-2-10. And also, there was a reference that they don't get a salary. That's actually not true. There is a compensation for presidential electors that is set forth by law uh, at OCGA 21-2-13. Um, additionally, the election code itself refers to the office of presidential elector. It refers to it as an office. Um, in two places in particular, 21-2-132A and 21-2-132E. Um, and again, we'd, we'd again rely on those cases that Mr. Gillen discussed, uh, Garrison versus the state, uh, 276 Georgia App, 243, 2005 case, where someone was convicted for impersonating uh, a federal agent, an un, unspecified federal agent, and that conviction was upheld by the Georgia Court of Appeals. Cert was denied by the Georgia Supreme Court. And then the Liberty case where they, uh, of course, impersonate the Metro Atlanta Human Trafficking Task Force that doesn't exist. So we would argue to the court that the definition for 1610.23's purposes that our courts, our appellate courts have um, applied a very liberal definition as a public officer. It doesn't even have to be a real public officer. It doesn't have to be a state officer. Anything that purports to be, you know, someone acting by authority of the government is a public officer. And that's certainly what presidential electors do. Their positions created by law, their duties are established by law. All right, so jumping down to the Forgery counts. Again, elephant in the room. Uh, 1691, there's at least five ways that you can violate the forgery statute. The cases that uh, Mr. Schaefer, the case that Mr. Schaefer relies on, Jackson versus the state, that's someone who was charged with uh, forgery based on purporting a document uh, purporting to have been made by another person. 
We did not charge under that provision of 1691. We charged under the final provision, which is by authority of one who did not give such authority. Um, Mr. Gillen says that we didn't object to looking at these, you know, things in, uh, in the record in other cases. Let me be clear for the record, we do object. That's the definition of going outside of the indictment. Um, so we agree with the court that considering those things outside of the indictment absolutely transforms uh, that into a speaking demur. It's void. It can't be granted. Um, if you look at the counts, the forgery counts, they track exactly the forgery statute. Um, case law tells us that that's what's sufficient for a general demur. I don't know that there's anything else to say about those counts. Um, as it relates to the false statements, again, address that at the very beginning. But I would point out that in, in Haley, uh, where both the conviction was upheld and the indictment itself was approved of, the indictment said this on the false statements counts. It said that the defendant did knowingly and willfully make a false and fictitious statement and representation in a matter within the jurisdiction of the GBI, a governmental agency, by calling himself the catch me killer and stating that he killed 16 people. It doesn't allege any of the things that Mr. Schaefer says in his pleadings that have to be alleged. They don't have to be alleged. Like they've done in other motions, uh, def defendant here is trying to add elements to this, ex to this offense that just don't exist, trying to add pleading requirements that don't exist. And Haley tells us uh, the case itself directly quotes the indictment. That indictment alleges far less than what we allege in our indictment. And they said that that the Georgia Supreme Court, Supreme Court said that that case is just fine. Um, I don't think that Mr. Gillen addressed the filing false documents motion. Um, I believe in the pleadings they state that those counts are flawed because they fail to allege that the filing of the false documents didn't succeed. Again, that's not a requirement uh, in an attempt charge. And they also say that uh, the counts don't say who actually attempted to place documents in a mailbox. The way that we've charged the count, we've charged all of those defendants individually and as persons concerned in the commission of a crime. And so it'll be for the jury to determine if they have, if, if all the defendants are liable for what one of their co-conspirators did. Um, with that, I'll take any questions that the court might have. Thank you, Mr. Worthen. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Gillen, your last motion we had for today. I have uh, like oh, sure. 60 seconds. For sure, have at it. <clears throat> The state did not and cannot answer the direct question about uh, a violation of the safe harbor rule, why that would allow uh, that uh, situation to give the governor or the secretary of state any authority to do anything. That uh, is, it comes in under several of the arguments that we've made. I won't repeat it, but they uh, simply their argument is, let's put an agent up and ask the agent whether or not he had authority. No. By law, by federal law, they did not have the authority. It's not whether some GBI agent thinks that he can come in here and tell the jury, pay no attention to federal law, pay no attention uh, to, to the dissenting opinion in Bush v. Gore, pay no attention to that, I'm a GBI agent, I say we can do it. That's wrong. Uh, they lose there because the law is very, very, very clear. And, uh, and we can go back and uh, we'll both the, the state and I know the Schaefer team will go back to look at our argument that we made to the court when my recollection could be wrong. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. We'll see. But my recollection was because the pleading was a part of the court system that we had a, a citation which permitted the court to take that into consideration as part of the record and thus not going outside of the record for speaking to Murr. I could be wrong, but we'll, we'll get that uh, to you uh, quickly because uh, that, you know, the, you know and, and they, they latch on to that to say, pay no attention to the reality of what happened in this courthouse, in this court, in the court filings, which destroys their argument and so with that your honor i'll sit down and then we'll i'll go back and get my other folder so on 
your last motion here, I, I, I'm kind of as we were with the First Amendment issue, I think we need to figure out where we are procedurally. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> federally, it sounds like, you know, this would be a pretty common motion. It'd be a surplusage motion. Georgia, it's not quite as clear for us. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we're, let's start with just the authority to kind of take a scalpel to an indictment and cut out things we don't like. Well, I, I mean, Your Honor, the you know, we we talk about there are two two components to this motion. One, there's the strike surplusage, and then there's a dismissal that we asked for, which is kind of also a component of the other. Now, uh, you know, we cite the uh, state fee uh, Corin. Uh, on the issue of being able to, uh, you know, the, the, the allegation, the indictment is not wholly unnecessary to constitute an offense as mere su surplusage. We, th we think... Right. Well, we th but when we read the surplusage opinions, we're talking about, you know, a miscited code section or um, a wrong date or something like that. So it, I, I, I don't know. I don't think that's what you're correct. No, no. I, I guess this is where I'm It's more coming. just a legal conclusion, right? Let me... Yeah, a, legal con con a legal conclusion, number one, but it's even more than that. It's, it's this. Uh, when, when they continually in their pleadings, in the indictment, in their pleadings, in their, in their uh, ex, uh, extrajudicial comments that they make. They have bombarded uh, the defendants, the electors in this case, with the concept of and the phrase of fake electors. Now that, that is not, uh, you know, that, that is a description, a conclusion, and a, and a pejorative description. Sure. So it's a legal conclusion you very much disagree with. It's the core of your defense. Uh, I, well, I, I, I think it's not only a legal uh, I, I conclusion, but it's also something that should be stricken because it is a, just a pejorative statement. I'm not saying, okay. I'm saying, you know, uh, I, can, I can call you something really nasty in an indictment, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a legal conclusion about your violation of, of a particular law. And so that's what we have here. And we, and we have this permeating this case. Well, I'm just trying to, again, based on what we've seen and is allowable in Georgia, uh, let's just make it simpler. If, if, if in a murder indictment someone's alleged to have acted with malice of forethought, that's a legal conclusion. Well, that's right. And it's something that the defendant may really have an issue with. But we don't strike it. We just go forward and we go to trial. Different world, different cases, not the point that I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, and you put in malice of forethought because you, you put that in there to it's define the element, terms. Sure. What, what about this one? There's one I remember when we talk about nicknames and aliases. And I remember there's one in Georgia from the 90s. They put in an alias of Stomper. And he had beat the defendant to death. Well, and the Supreme Court said, "That's okay." You know why? Because they probably proved that there was an alias of that guy called Stomper. That's different than the that trial. The state's saying we're going to prove that you're well, I, I, an unlawful I think, elector. Or well, like, no, know, no, 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 no. In this indictment, what they have done in the indictment, it's not necessary for if they want to, if they want to. And we think it should be stricken. We think the count should be dismissed. We know that based upon the case law that we've cited. But in closing arguments, Lord forbid we ever get to closing arguments, hope we don't. But if we did, and they stood up and they said, well, we think that they were fake, we think the evidence shows that they were fake electors. That's one thing. That's argument. That's advocacy. There's no place for it in the indictment. And there's no place for it in what they have done, not only in the indictment, but in their pleadings and statements they've made outside to the media. What they have tried to do is they want to have ingrained in the minds of the community and of jurors a concept that if you were not a Democratic uh, elector uh, on December the 14th, casting your vote at, the other, at some other uh, part of the, of the state capitol, then you are a fake elector. And that is a pejorative term, not necessary for the charges, and should be stricken. That's the point that we're trying to make. Um, and as it relates to our other arguments concerning uh, the, 
the uh, dismissal of those counts. I don't think I need to go back over most of my argument or our argument on that really deals with the Electoral Count Act. So I don't think I need to revisit that in case the court <laughs> will get there. <laughs> really, really wants to hear that again. I don't I don't think you do. But uh, absent that, Your Honor, we think, number one, that the that the count should be dismissed. The reasons uh, articulated earlier and in our pleading and number two that even if the counts are dismissed in addition to that references throughout the indictment to fake electors should be stricken as well thank you all right thank you mr yellen judge i'll be brief nowhere in this indictment is the phrase fake elector it does not exist literally not in the indictment so I'm not really sure what we're talking about, removing something from the indictment that's not there. Um, as the court pointed out, and, and I struggle with this motion, and I'm not gonna say much because we're primarily relying on our response, but an indictment is itself a legal conclusion. Every allegation in an indictment is a legal conclusion. That's what an allegation is. And so if indictments aren't allowed to have legal conclusions, then I guess we aren't allowed to have indictments anymore. Um, Judge, I think what, the defense's strategy is here, and I know it's their strategy because they asked for it in the motion. They say, Judge, you should strike this language from these counts because we don't like it, it's not fair, it's pejorative, whatever reason. And now that you've stricken it, the counts don't charge a crime anymore, so you should dismiss them because they don't charge a crime anymore. That's nonsensical. Um, we cite in our briefs uh, opinions where the court says, the appellate court said you literally can't do that if something's essential to the charge if it's essential to to pleading an, an essential element of the charge you can't strike it it's not subject to being stricken and i just highlight one one citation that we reference in our brief malloy versus the state 293 georgia 350 2013 supreme court case and that case says that when an indictment when language in an indictment accurately describes the offenses charged and makes them easier to understand or more easily understood they're not subject to being stricken because they're not surplusage and that uh in making that an, in not in analyzing language in an indictment you know in this context malloy also says that it, that the language is to be interpreted liberally in favor of the state and so uh with that again we rely on our pleadings the phrase fake elector does not exist in this indictment. Uh, take any questions that the court may have, but otherwise, uh, nothing further. Uh, maybe one, uh, you know, I've seen a line of cases talking about whether defects, you know, can be stricken, and that a lot of that depended on whether they're material or non-material. Is it safe to say that these phrases, the ones that are, are highlighted here, lawful elector votes, false electoral college votes and duly elected and qualified presidential electors. Would you say those are material phrases for each of the charges they appear in? So I think <clears throat> that's a that's a great question and I think there's kind of a superficial answer and then maybe a more in-depth answer. My superficial answer is yes, they're material um, in the sense that they make the charges more easily understood. They're accurate to describe the charges. Um, I, I am familiar with that line of cases and it's a little bit unclear in the cases whether material means that or whether material means that, um, you know, if you strike the, something from the indictment that the count falls apart. Sure. So it, it, I'm not clear. What I know is in this context, I don't think it matters because what's being challenged, I, I think it's I think that it's approved of by our appellate decision. If, if you've happened to gone, go down that road, though, uh, and we take the position that material means it, it can still survive uh, general demur. Um, any thoughts there? Judge, again, turning back to Malloy, the, the, the holding in Malloy is that as long as the, the language in an indictment, even if it's not essential to an essential element, as long as it's accurate, it describes the offense's charge, and it makes it more easy to understood, it's simply not surplusage. If it's not surplusage, it's not subject to being stricken. But do we think these phrases are material and, and meaning they're necessary to survive a general demur? I don't have them in front of me. So. Je 
I don't either, okay. and so I hesitate to give an answer without the indictment in front of me. That's fine. You know, again, as long as the, as long as the charges track the statute, they survive a general demur. So anything that's not statutory language, I guess, wouldn't fall into that category. Um, but then we get into special demur territory, and uh, that's a whole different situation. All right. Fair enough. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Anything else we should, uh, or matters of housekeeping, anything else we need to take up before we break? Anything from the state? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Young. Anything from either Nothing counsel? Okay. Um, then we'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Judge.